Then we check the building blocks of the evolution one last time, because we are ready. With 200 laser turrets at our disposal and the promise of 3.5 million iron, we are ready to do whatever it takes in order to claim that iron for ourselves. Between us and that iron lies this. Large interconnected biter bases, with small but high evolution biter expansions sprinkled in between. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Following the advice of the legendary Sun Tzu himself, we have been meticulously planning every detail during every moment of this playthrough. It has all been leading up to this very moment. Have we already won the war before we go into battle? Or are we, forced by our iron deficit, going into battle too early, already being defeated, and then seek to win? It will all become clear. So, if you thought that I was just gonna rush into battle like a madman, then you didn't take Sun Tzu's advice to heart. We are going to win first and then go into battle. Now, a good preparation is half the battle, so we take great care in designing our offense blueprint, taking in mind several key concepts. First, our personal roboports support 30 bots only, so the blueprint should consist of no more than 30 elements. That means the whole blueprint can be placed simultaneously by the 30 bots. This is important because, let's face it, bots don't like you. If they need two trips to place the blueprint, you can bet on it that they'll decide not to place the substation on the first trip, leaving your shiny laser turrets unpowered. And by the time they'll get back there with the substation, your laser turrets are dead, and so will be your bots. And if we lose our turrets, it's over. We don't have enough resources to keep replacing them. The second key concept is to make our blueprint tileable, both horizontally and vertically. This will make sure every new placement is protected by the previous placement and automatically connected to the power network. For the vertical distance we choose the maximum substation connection distance, in order to make more progress with each step. The third concept is to space the turrets one tile apart, which will prevent splash damage from damaging multiple turrets at once. Fourth, we remove the corner turrets. They have the highest likelihood to be targeted by many enemies, most of which will not be among our turrets first targets if they even are in range of the other turrets at all. Fifth, we make sure some of the turrets overlap between each blueprint placement. And finally, for situations where we'll face heavy resistance too large for our vertical connection distance, we counterintuitively remove one turret. This allows us to vertically fit another blueprint placement more close by, with a new substation taking the spot of that removed turret. Then we check the building blocks of the evolution one last time, because we are ready. Now, the first nest should be very easy. It's small, lies fairly isolated, and we've still got the protection of our base in the back. Also, the nearby lake even took a bite out of their base, changing its shape from a dangerous circular blob to a long and thin banana, so it's easy enough to just keep chipping away at the front. We can even use some grenades and rockets to help out. Even the accumulators were not impressed by that biter base, they haven't even broken a sweat yet. A small retreat to reassemble the troops and let's tackle the next one. which goes down without a problem. Now we need to take on the small expansions, which contain worms outranging us. But we can actually use the rocket launcher to help out with that. Another small expansion with only one medium worm protecting it. Let's just fully overpower them and place a blueprint right in their face. But the biters actually are smart. Even though the bot tries to place the substation to power the lasers, the spitters physically block the placement, leaving our turrets without power. 
Once the substation is finally placed though, the lasers quickly overpower the small biter base. Anyway, we lost 4 bots due to the smart enemy tactic. Now, before we continue any further, we already placed the belts which will bring back the iron ore from the future iron outpost. And in our case, while both setups can carry 30 ore per second, two yellow belts are better than one red belt. Not only are two yellow belts cheaper than one red belt, it also requires us to place twice as many belts. This is a good thing, because every belt we place reduces the nearby enemy expansion chance. That enemy expansion demotivation is actually the main reason we already placed those belts now. Without those belts, the enemy will likely settle several expansions right behind our back as we push further out. At the next base we place the initial laser turrets quite badly inside the range of a big worm who resides outside the range of our laser turrets. Big worms are so powerful they easily one shot construction bots. So we quickly stash our repair packs in a chest so no more bots fly out trying to repair damaged turrets or fellow damaged bots and again use the rocket launcher to solve the problem. Maybe I was wrong about classifying the rocket launcher as a defensive tech. There are still several other big worms present, so we use the in your face technique again. But we still lose a couple more bots in the process. This technique we're using is probably the main reason the higher bot speeds are hidden behind the yellow high tech signs. And rightly so. Anyway, denying the bots access to the repair packs is an important element of our strategy. So hopefully I won't forget to do that just about every time from now on. Not only will that keep them from dying while trying to repair stuff, it will also keep them available for new construction, making sure the laser turrets get powered. Bots not being available for construction due to trying to repair stuff is exactly what happens during the next attack. And like predicted, of all the things, they skip placing the substation, leaving our laser turrets as sitting ducks. After I spent so much effort outlining all of the finer details of my blueprint design, I am not using it accordingly, with these embarrassing small disasters happening as a result. Let's hope that when we start taking out the real biter bases, we will step up our game, because if we frick up there, it can all be over in an instant. Then we sneak in the forest by midnight to place some more illegal belts, destroying whatever rainforests and scenic cliff formations which may be in our way. Meanwhile, our base is mostly idle, using only 8 megawatts. This is great actually, as it gives us a large power margin to keep the accumulators from running out too quickly once we assault the big nests. Next up are two big connected biter bases, smartly located inside the forest, making it more difficult for us to place our blueprints. This is the first real test, which we should not screw up. So, naturally, we forget to stash our repair packs in a chest outside of the bot's reach. So, we lose another three bots quickly. Again leading to an unplaced substation. But hey, at least we're using our blueprint as intended this time. I can't say we're doing great, but we're making progress nonetheless. I tried to help out personally with some grenades. A foolish move, because the enemy has grown far too powerful for me to attack in person, even while wearing the Mark 1 power armor. Once the different asset attacks reduce your mobility enough, you become too slow to move out of the way for new asset attacks. Then the damage can stack up very fast and it can be hard to impossible to retreat at that point. And then, yes, a true miracle. I finally start to use my blueprint correctly as I intended with the design. I even put my repair packs away this time. And, as you can see, once we use the blueprint correctly, it is indeed very powerful. Stand back, place, wait for the bots to build it while holding down shift to keep the blueprint grid position. And once the bots return, swipe left, right or up for the next placement. Rinse and repeat. With this method, we actually manage to plow through the two connected biter bases with relative ease, while keeping both ourselves and our bots mostly out of the line of fire. The key to this method is to keep pushing forward as quickly as possible, so any worms outranging the current laser turrets don't have enough time to destroy them. Needless to say, this method does quickly eat up our available laser turrets, which is the main reason I insisted on 200 turrets before starting the attack. 
Running out in the middle of a push like this would be pretty bad. While we did clear a walking path towards the iron ore patch, we are not done yet. The most difficult part is yet to come. There's one more giant biter nest located way too close to the iron patch. But first, as we reach the edge of our explored terrain, let's place a whole bunch of raiders to quickly reveal a lot of land. So now let me show you how not to turret creep. Pro tip, when using the turret creep method, first place a protected fallback point, so you don't die like an idiot while the bots take all the time in the world to place the turrets. <sighs> I have showcased so many forms of bad combat during this playthrough, it is truly a miracle I'm still alive. We must have been blessed by an overwatching entity or something, I don't know. Anyway, before we take on the final boss biter base of the iron mine, we first need a moment of zen. So let's change our flamethrower defense to be behemoth spitter proof, which basically means placing the flamethrowers one tile further back. And once we try to fit the blueprint around the iron mine, we can clearly see there's no way around it. This giant nest needs to go. Meanwhile, the raiders revealed a lot of new terrain, and you can clearly see the open land between the giant biter bases has already been settled with new biter expansions during the course of the game. To meet my endgame promise of world peace though, somehow I will have to find a way to kill all enemies and bases, even in the unrevealed map. How the heck is that even possible? Anyway, let's focus on the order of the day for now. Taking out the final boss. Oh shit, forgot about the repair packs again, oh no. Oh, I stowed them away just in time. Okay, let's be smart with the blueprints this time. Nice progress, nice progress. The accumulators are two thirds drained though. Should we retreat? Nah, I think we can finish this nest off before they run out. Push forward.
All right, that'll do. Let's retreat. I think we can truthfully say we've conquered the iron mine now. Huzzah! Let's compare the evolution building blocks before and after destroying just a couple of these massive biter bases. Before we started on our rampage, the enemy destroy factor contributed a measly 1 14th to the evolution factor. Now it has grown to a whopping 1 4th. But let's not waste too much time, let's build that iron mine before the enemy expands back right on top of it. We start by outlining the defensive perimeter with our blueprints. Then we can use the copy tool to see exactly how much stuff we need to go collect from the main base. Most notably 700 walls and 22 flamethrower turrets. As well as roughly 125 miners. I hope we still have some iron left at the main base to actually make those miners though. Some of the stuff we already have on us. But before we allow the bots to build the belts, we make sure to deny them access to our miners and flamethrowers, as those could trigger biter attacks before we are ready to handle them. Fortunately, yes, we do have enough iron to make the iron miners for my iron mine. But with only 5 iron miners still operational and 8k iron ore remaining, it sure was a close call. Let's already connect the new iron ore belts to the furnace array, so it'll automatically start up once the new iron mine is built. So let's head back to the outpost. Oh, some biters. No problem, I will just escape through my walls again like before, with my fake deconstruction hack. No, no, no bots, don't take down the walls, are you mad? Man oh man, I'm telling you, bots really do hate your guts. Okay, so that trick we can't use anymore, Lamau. Anyway, we hopefully protect the belts from the flamethrower fire as long as the biters will cooperate by not attacking the walls out of reach of the flamethrowers. We are not going to construct 700 walls with our 30 personal bots though. I'd almost forget you can use construction robots to actually construct things instead of only keeping the walls repaired. So while the bots will slowly but surely construct the full wall, we will need to get some oil over here for the flamethrowers. So we need to barrel some. We go with 400 barrels, which is equal to about 80% of a fluid storage tank. Finally, we take some repair packs, the first half of the oil barrels, and I think we're ready to finalize the setup and switch it on. A new biter expansion has already settled in the now vacated lands. Anyway, we can't keep them out, so let's not worry about it. Only now that we have the flamethrower fuel on location, we will allow the bots to place the flamethrowers. The 
defensive perimeter complete. Lastly, we allow the bots to place the mines. And before two minutes have gone, pollution is already spreading out on biter bases on all sides. And we can see the first attack group forming. Oh, looks like they were already not the first. Anyway, the bots should be able to run the show without our help now. So let's head back to the main base where we can now have all the things. And only after using over 99% of our starter iron mine, we finally managed to get a new source of iron flowing into the base. Full bells, baby. With three and a half million iron under our control now, we can treat ourselves to all things iron again. A steel buffer. Red chips. Actually, frick you, iron chest. Let's upgrade the whole base to steel chests. Away with those crappy iron chests. Next to the wooden chests you go. Let's not forget to bring over the other half of the oil barrels to the iron outpost. There, I think that's gonna be enough oil for a long time. And also, we're gonna attack all the things. So, what's next? Have we won the game? Well, no actually. While iron was surely the most pressing issue due to the whole base being made out of iron, soon we will need more of all other resources as well. In fact, coal is already struggling right now and we have no long term solution for oil and we're entering the stage where the emphasis shifts over from iron to copper, which will become an issue very soon. Basically, while it may not be apparent immediately, we still have the same problem as with the iron before, except it's now three times the problem. Thanks to the huge forest in between us and the iron, we had to clear relatively few biter bases to get over there, but I don't see easy solutions for the other resources. And with biter revolution further increased since the iron assault, the ever growing ratio of big biters and big spitters will cause more and more problems. Will we prevail? Find out. You guessed it, next time. <laughs>